What you got in Grantham is the 9th Air Force. So you've got a four-star American general in Grantham. 9th Air Force is the logistical lift. So the Air Force, so all the planning for D-Day, for the air support, was done in Grantham. Uh -huh. And all the air support and stuff for Arnhem was done in Grantham. If you think about something like uh, the two big air operations for the Allies in World War II are going to be D-Day and Arnhem. So D-Day you're dropping something like 25,000 paratroopers either side of the D-Day beachheads. You're going to need hundreds of planes, hundreds of support, all the logistics. If you, if you, go, if you go to the graveyard, there's a really posh house at the back of the graveyard called St Vincent's House. It's owned by an American investment banker, I think. So it's all big security guards and lights and dogs and stuff. But that house used to be the headquarters of the 9th Air Force and they did all the heavy lifts. So all these guys, plus the 101st, plus the 82nd Airborne, all got logist all the planning was done in Harlington, um, in Grantham. So lot and all around here is massive air bases. It's still air bases from World War II that are still active. What we have then is the air, is the insignia of the 1st Airborne Division. It's got the classic um, British Airborne Forces, which is two wings and a parachute. This is what, it, it, any, if you ever see anybody in, a, in, in uniform in the UK and they've got two blue wings and a parachute, they're Airborne Trained or Airborne Forces. But the division itself has Pegasus, which is the winged horse with, in this case, a very different design with a warrior on the top with a great big spear. This, it's, in, it's not in great nick, but it's um, 70 years old. It was built by the guys who actually came back from Arnhem, of which there were not too many, made out of concrete, and they cast, just done it by hand and, and then painted it in the colours. British Airborne Forces, interestingly, have recently decided to go back to using this insignia, so it's going to become an, an active insignia again. So, First Airborne Division, their memorial, this is where we have on um, the 11th of November. 11th of November every year is, the, is Armistice Day in the UK. It's the day the war ended in the First World War, 11am, 11th of November, that's when it stopped. Um, so every year since the First World War ended in 1918, you have a memorial service on November the 11th at 11am. And what we do now is we have members of the Parachute Regiment, because there isn't a division anymore, but they come back and they line up here and they do their insignia and drop the flags and everything and put poppy weeds on this in November. So if you were ever to come back, so this is why you got the crosses here, this is where people just put little memorials to family members who were in airborne forces and it's starting to become a bit of um, a focal point for airborne forces in the UK because there isn't anything like this at all in, in anywhere else in the country. So it's quite a unique feature. So you've got the first airborne here, 1944, planning to go to D-Day. They're not used at D-Day, but will be used at Arnhem. If you've got active service personnel around the place, you have machine guns, which you need to be very careful with. Or you can have it in your hand and let off a burst of machine gun fire across the front of that tower. So if you look carefully, you've got big chunks of the brickwork there by the window, there on the corner over that window, and going up, almost like someone's got a machine gun and they've got it, in, they haven't got the safety on, and it's just gone in their hands like this, and they're the bullet holes that flow all the way up that tower. That's so called the Pegasus Tower. Now this key should get me in there because we've got a phenomenal piece. This is a good bit of World War II archaeology, but there's an even more phenomenal piece. Now you saw a uh, bridge too far? Yeah. Did you say you've watched that? Right, in a bridge too far, you've got Anthony Hopkins actually makes it to the bridge. So you've got, out of an entire division, only one battalion manages to actually get to the bridge and they get to the north end of the bridge. That's the second battalion. Anthony Hopkins is playing a guy called Colonel John Frost, who is commander of the 2nd Battalion. So the only battalion out of that entire division to actually get to the bridge and fight on the bridge was the 2nd Battalion. We have Arcadot, so we've got a close association with the division, but 2nd Battalion was actually here too. And we've got archaeological proof to demonstrate that, so I will go and show you that. So the actual unit, not just the ones who fought at Arnhem, but the ones who actually got to the bridge at Arnhem, were here too. Right, so you watched uh, Bridge Too Far. Yep. Second Battalion gets to the bridge, they're the ones holding the end of that bridge with um, Anthony Hopkins. Well, somebody stood here where you are in 1944 
and carved Pride of the British Army, 2nd Parachute Battalion, 1st Airborne Brigade, North Africa, Sicily, Italy. So this guy, whoever was stood here was in the 2nd Parachute Battalion, so they'd have been fighting at the bridge in Arnhem. They'd have fought in North Africa with a parachute drop, fought in Sicily, fought in Italy, and then what they should have put here was then Arnhem. But of course, 2nd Parachute Battalion gets completely wiped out at the bridge at Arnhem. So that there's no last piece. But this is basically a complete history of British Airborne Forces in World War II up to Arnhem if you're in the 1st Airborne Division. And so the guy who stood here and carved that was actually at Arnhem on the bridge in the movie. He'd have been where you've got uh, Anthony Hopkins fighting all at that end of the bridge. He'd have been in that and he stood here. They're certainly here in June um, because there's that photo of them down by the walled garden being inspected by George VI. So they're certainly here in June, so you'd probably put them springtime getting here because they've just finished in Italy. They're going to come in here, get set up. So they're going to be based at this house. They're going to be over at Beaver Castle, all the main houses. Because you've got 10,000 guys you've got to find accommodation for. So these are ideal. Um, so they're certainly here from the early spring. They're, High alert, ready to go, 6th June, ready to go in his reserve if needed be. Not, so they go down a bit. Um, and then, so they're going to be here um, early spring to about November. And then what's left, after what can get, what they can pull out from Arnhem and get back, because they're on the other side. They've landed on the other side of the Rhine. That's the problem. They, if you're at Nijmegen, yeah, take your time. If you're at Nijmegen and, Ar and Eindhoven, you're in Holland, so the, Allied, the Americans and British can get to you. But if you're at Arnhem, you're actually in Germany. You're on the other side of the river. You're in proper enemy territory. So you've got to get to that bridge to get across it to get them. If you can't get to them, they're, they're, basically anybody who got out of Arnhem swam the Rhine. You basically took your combat jacket off and you're going to have to do either physically swim it or do a rope swim across the River Wine to get them out of there, which is why you've got so few. Um, but the ones who did get back were the ones who built that as a, as a, as a permanent memorial. I wonder what you've got I... here is some remarkable bits and pieces left over from the Second World War. First off, You've got about 10,000 troops that need to be billeted in the locality. So every room in the manor is going to be used. What we know is that in 1944, that Corporal England and Corporal Tyler and Corporal Clement were wound in room five because somebody stood there in 1945 with a bit of chalk and said, England, Tyler, Clement, you lot in here. So three lads in here at some point. There's going to be a lot of rotation. For example, Clement Tyler and uh, England, I think we discovered, were in um, one part of the division. This is going to be another part of the division. Now, this is a really interesting, it's a remarkable piece, actually. It's absolutely bloody marvellous. Right, now, somebody in the 1970s or whenever there was a lot of very naughty students doing a lot of naughty things back in the 70s, um, somebody decided to get some wax crayon and colour it yellow, green and pink. Good, actually, because that's wax crayon, so that's waterproofed it. Um, so that's, in a weird way, it's actually... Then, of course, they had a sort of slight issue with their pen and went a bit bonkers. But, brilliant. Now, what you've got here, then, is... So we know it's airborne because it's two wings either side of a parachute. We also know that the airborne forces were volunteers. You didn't get, conscript you didn't get drafted into airborne, you volunteer for airborne. Well, the insignia behind it, you've got this round circle here and then these almost like flames coming out. That's the insignia of a fusilier, uh, the guy in, Back in the 18th century, fusiliers were the guys who threw the grenades and such like. So that's an 18th century grenade. Think a ca small cannonball on fire. So whoever this guy was, was originally in the fusiliers, who then transfers to airborne forces. The unit that he transfers to is F 
F-O-U-R-A. What that stands for is Forward Observation Unit Royal Artillery. Again, like Killick, they're going to go in first. When the planes come in, they go first. If you think about an airborne force, it's going to go light. You're going to have relatively light equipment because everything you fight with has to be flown in. So you're not going to fly in with tanks. You're not going to fly in with the big heavy stuff because you just can't get them in a plane. It's going to be light equipment. Well, if you walk up against something like a German tank, you need some heavy punch from somewhere. That's what their job's to do. Their job is to sit here on the front line and if German tanks come in, radio back 10, 15 miles to the heavy artillery and say, I want you to drop X amounts of shells on that point directly over there. And they're the guys that give you that additional support to stop you getting overrun by German tanks. So if you're the Germans, you definitely want to kill these guys because without them, the infantry has got no heavy support. So they go in first, coming in on a wing. So we know they were here in 1944. Where he gets, re and we also know this guy. Again, wings, parachute, FOU, forward observation unit. So we know somebody from the FOU unit was in here too, alongside those guys. But where it gets really interesting, if you're into military iconography and heraldry, that one that's odd that is your airborne insignia two wings and, a, and a, a parachute you see it here you see it here and you see it on the monument that is different that's two wings but the parachute is on a shield and the shield is topped with a crown the later insignias taken, has simplified it, lose the crown, lose the shield, and just have the two wings and the parachute. This is a lot earlier. That's from about 1942. So the question is, did the association of Harleston with airborne forces start in 1944, or did it start back in 1942, which is when airborne forces were actually Bill, um, the biggest German airborne attack of World War II was the invasion of Crete, and they put all their airborne forces on that island in the eastern Mediterranean. Churchill turns around and says, we want to be able to do that too. So 1942 is why you get airborne forces. That's why the insignia on that wall starts North Africa, because that's where they start building airborne troops. Well, this is a 1942 insignia. And this is L.H. Hopkins Wood, number 348. Um, can't work out what that says, but he's datelined it 27th January, 1942. So there was someone from Airborne Forces right at the start of the formation of Airborne Forces in the British Army in 42. That's 44. That's 42. And that is a mystery because it suggests that this was for a long time, well before D-Day, well before Marnham, there was, a, there was something going on here with that air base at the back, nicely tucked away, out of sight, small air base, not one of the major ones, not something very obvious, with airborne forces coming through here. So if you want to sort of extend it a little bit, I do wonder whether that would be the perfect air base with someone with airborne training to be parachuted into Germany behind the lines if you were doing that kind of work up here. I don't know. But that is very odd next to that because there's two years between that and that. And that's what we can't account for. What's he doing here in 42? 44? Yeah, they're building up for Arnhem and D-Day. Who's he? What's he doing here? And that's where it gets interesting. And, that's, and as I said, that's 40 minutes. And that's our Harleston story of World War II. That insignia, that graffiti, and that memorial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.